Hi, this is Len Edgerly. Welcome to the Kindle Chronicles podcast for Tuesday, August 2nd, 2022. I am recording this episode in Ocean Park, Maine. My guest this week is Mohsen Hamid, whose fifth novel, The Last White Man, was released today by Riverhead uh, Books. That's an imprint of Penguin Random House. His new book has generated a great deal of interest, and I'll tell you about his previous four novels in a, in a little bit. But uh, Kirkus Reviews calls the book, quote, a brilliantly realized allegory of racial transformation and a provocative tale that raises questions of racial and social justice at every turn. Uh, Oprah Daly, in November of last year, raved in advance of the novel's publication uh, stating that it, uh, describing it this way, gorgeously crafted, morally authoritative, the last white man concludes on a note of hope, a door jarred open just enough to let transcendence pour through literature's mission incarnate, or as Hamid says, quote, there is a basic human desire to be led away from destabilization, but also a vital need to make an imaginary journey through it. Uh, Elle Magazine called it a tale of poignant magical realism, haunting and arresting in equal measure. Uh, So uh, he was, uh, there was a piece about him in the Sunday New York Times book review section uh, a couple of days ago. And uh, you'll be seeing him interviewed uh, in lots of different places. Uh, My interview with him on Friday was part of a lineup that was set up by the excellent publicity department at uh, Penguin. Uh, he has an amazing biography. Uh, uh, Mosin was born in Lahore. That's a city of nearly 12 million people in northeast Pakistan. Uh, he spent about half his life there in Lahore and much of the rest of his life in London, New York, and California. He lived in the U.S. between the ages of three and nine while his father was enrolled in a Ph.D. program at Stanford. He then returned to Lahore Uh, until entering Princeton at the age of 18, came back to the U.S. In 1993, he graduated summa cum laude with a B.A. from the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs at Princeton. He completed a 127-page senior thesis on sustainable power in Pakistan, but that was not the only significant writing he did as a college student. Uh, He ended up working with Toni Morrison, who was on the faculty at Princeton, and he wrote the first draft of his first novel, working with her, The Reluctant Fundamentalist, and that was published in 2007. It sold a million copies internationally and hit the number four spot on the New York Times bestseller list. Uh, not too bad for a debut novel, and it was turned into a movie in 2012, directed by Mira Nair. Mosin's biography would be impressive enough if we left it at his work as a novelist, but wait, there's more. Uh, He went on to earn a law degree at the Harvard Law School and worked as a brand consultant uh, at Wolf Olin's, rising to manager managing director of the firm's London office, and in 2015 he was appointed the firm's first ever chief storyteller officer. Uh, His previous, uh, I mentioned The Reluctant Fundamentalist, uh, that was published in 2007, then Moth Smoke was his second novel. His third is one that I read, How to Get Filthy Rich in Rising Asia, and that's a satiric uh, take on sort of the dark side of success in these Asian economies uh, created as a self-help book. That was published in 2013. Uh, Exit West I did not read. It was published in 2017, and I read that the premise of it was uh, everything was real except in various houses or buildings there were doors that people if they entered them you would enter the door in say Lahore and you would come out immediately in London or New York or somewhere else and as a result millions of people could very easily move around the world and that gave him a chance to uh, consider issues regarding migration and uh, and the fear of migration. This novel that uh, we'll talk about in the interview was uh, there was a a version of it in the New Yorker in May uh, called The Face in the Mirror and it was uh, an excerpt from the novel that was published there in the New Yorker. I reached Mosin Friday August 29th in New York uh, from uh, the place here in Maine and here is our conversation. Hello Mosin. 
Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? Good, thank you. Are are you in New York or where are you on your travels for I, this project? I, I, I am in New York. I am in New York. Where, where are you? I am on the coast of Maine, looking out at a very calm sea. So, oh, uh, wonderful! This is as serene as I get. <laughs> Fantastic! Have you spent the entire pandemic there? Just about. Uh, we spent some time in Florida, but the, the the real pandemic months were on the same beach and. Uh, it was hard to remember that there was something awful going on. I know. It's, it's sort of a perfect location to, to see it out. Yeah. Uh, well, I thought as a way to uh, get into our conversation, in the note to the reader, it begins by noting that the book's origins can be traced back to uh, September 11th. Uh, how so? Well, I've lived uh, 18 of the first 30 years of my life uh, in the U.S. up till 2001, uh, the rest in Pakistan. And I, uh, for the most part, um, had lived in sort of cosmopolitan cities. I'd gone to uh, elite universities, and I had a well-paying job in New York. So um, while I was a you know brown man with a Muslim-sounding name, um, my experiences of discrimination hadn't been something I thought of as, as you know particularly major in any way. And, uh, you know, I went about my life uh, pretty much without uh, any serious encumbrance. And then suddenly I found I was being pulled out of the line for extra security at airports. I was being held for hours at immigration in a special room and interrogated. Now people were looking uncomfortable when I went down to a bus or a train with a backpack if I was a bit unshaven. And I thought, this is so strange. Like suddenly I've become this object of suspicion or even fear. And I felt like I had lost something, and and I wanted things to go back to the way they were. And as the years went by, and I thought, you know, what is it that I've lost? Um, I I came to think that you know I've lost a kind of partial whiteness that um, I'd been allowed to pass in America, uh, and suddenly that was no longer the case. And, and it made me think, you know, what was this thing, and uh, how had I been complicit in it? And what does it mean to partake of those benefits? Uh, maybe instead of wishing to move things back, I should interrogate the thing that I was participating in a bit more closely. Hmm. Good. And so if you could just read those last two paragraphs that follows from what you just said. I had been offered a reminder that race is a construct. It is brought into existence by our imaginations. And from there, it is deployed with real consequences. There are darker and lighter skin colors, of course. But these skin colors are in and of themselves no more meaningful than blood types. It is we who invent race and its terrible meanings. But though potent, our inventions are not stable. They sprang into existence not so very long ago. They are constantly changing. And one day, they will be gone. I believe fiction has a strange power a profound weirdness that enables it to destabilize the collective imaginings we inherit and reproduce. Novels are created jointly by writers who write words and by readers who transform. Novels are created jointly by writers who write words and by readers who transform words into people, images, feelings. In this very odd space of novelistic co-creation of two human beings making together while individually in solitude, radical new possibilities can be born. My four previous novels sought to open spaces to imagine differently. This one does as well. In order to have futures that do not cling monstrously to nostalgias for the past, we must imagine our futures, or rather, we must permit our imaginations futures to play with. I hope you will do so with me in the pages that follow. <laughs> That's wonderful on so many levels, it's especially the the insight into how fiction can destabilize. I guess another way to to come into this is: uh, Did you have a, a question that you were hoping to explore in the writing of this book? It seemed to me that uh, so much of um, our present society is something that we think of as real. Um, almost like it has a physical reality, when in fact it's just been imagined. Um, in a way, the story we tell ourselves about race is a kind of fable. 
that these races exist, that we belong to them, that they shape who we are, that they're meaningful identifiers of, of what we are. Um, and, and because so many of us believe in this fable, the fable has power. And so I guess I wanted to explore what happens if you present an alternative fable. Um, if you put a fable where that stuff starts to disappear, where it becomes impossible to understand what race anybody belongs to um, and what happens to society in, in those circumstances. I think one of the interesting things about fiction is um, fiction can be quite honest because so much of the life that we actually live is itself a fiction, even though we pretend it's a fact. Yeah. Um, well, and in the co-creation of the book, uh, you you present us with a story and some central characters. Uh, let's talk about about that. Who who did who have you put in front of us as readers to uh, accompany you on this imaginary exercise? So the novel has only two named characters. Those are Anders and Una, a young man and a young woman who are dating, but not in a particularly serious way, and who have each experienced uh, significant loss. Uh, Anders' mother died when he was younger. Uh, his father is unwell. Uh, Una has lost her father also when she was uh, in school, and more recently her brother. And they are uh, people who had a high school fling who have been sort of reunited in a time of loss. But uh, they probably wouldn't have said that their relationship was that significant when the novel begins. Uh, it changes. Uh, interestingly enough, in the novel, uh, Una and Anders um, are better able to see each other as they change. Uh, as, their, as their surfaces become different, they are able to understand what's underneath the surface a bit better. And so they become closer uh, as the novel progresses. Uh, alongside them are Anders' father, uh, who's very unwell, and uh, Una's mother, who is gripped with a kind of sorrow at the loss of her son and her husband and also of a, of a belief that the world was benign. Uh, Una's mother thought, you know, she lived in a world where good things happened to good people. And once she lost her father, uh, once she lost Una's father and Una's brother, um, Una's mother came to a view that, no, this is a different kind of world, where people are under attack, where people are under threat, where her group is under threat. And she has the kind of belief that, that white people are in the process of being erased. Uh, a crazy conspiracy theory, which in the course of the novel actually turns out to be not untrue. Um, and so and so her journey and Una's journey uh, has a certain tension between it, just as Andres' father's journey and Andres' journey does. And the, uh, the, 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 the sort of magical part of it or the part where you tweak reality in the story is uh, everyone in their town, one by one at different times, uh, the white people become brown or black. And... Uh, I, I I was talking with my wife uh, here on the porch this morning over coffee, and I, she hasn't read the book yet, but I told her, you know, this is the premise, and he's trying to get us to think about it. And uh, she said, well, what do you think about it, you know? And, and uh, so I had to step back from sort of normal interviewer mode. And uh, I, I found that my personal reaction was a little bit awkwardly naive in that I'm 71, and I'm always sort of reinventing myself. Uh, you know, today I'm going to be a poet. And, then, and I, I could imagine looking down and finding myself brown or black as uh, one last great adventure, you know, and I would write about it and I would do all this stuff. And when I was younger, I worked in Roxbury, the, the, the uh, ghetto part of Boston, and I had some uh, sort of fantasizing based on stereotypes of how cool it would be to be black. I felt like just this awkward white kid from the suburbs. And these guys I was working with uh, were amazed. I'd never heard of Janis Joplin and all this stuff. And I thought, man, it would be so cool. Uh, so my putting myself in Andrew's shoes, you know, eliminating all of the horrors of racism and how a black person actually gets treated in this country. That was my first reaction. And my wife's first reaction was not personal. It wasn't, oh, if I was Una, I would feel this. She said, I would so be relieved to live in a place that that didn't have racism, that you couldn't be racist because there was no different races. So she immediately went to sort of the societal feeling oh. of what it would be. And so we, we sort of experienced the power of it. And, and then I was wondering, 
if you had made it so that all of the black people turned white, how do you think that would have been a different platform for the imagination to sort of tease the reader forward in a, a kind of an optimistic, hopefully uh, imaginative reaction? Well, there's two things I'd, I'd say in response to what you said, which is very interesting. Um, the first one was uh, restoring a sense of adventure and hopefulness to what might come. I think one of the things that we're grappling with at the moment is that uh, for so many people, the idea that the future is an optimistic place is becoming harder to um, to believe it. Uh, for much of my life, I'm 51, uh, even if it was naive to think so, I thought you know, things were going to keep getting better. Poverty would reduce in poor countries. Um, health would improve. Uh, we would become uh, better able to protect the environment. We would be less racist and, and uh, class differences would diminish. Technology would make us free, et cetera, et cetera. And now, um, you know, a quarter of the way into the 21st century, it's getting harder to believe those things. It seems like the dominant worldview is a kind of pessimistic one where things are going to fall apart. The environmental the environment is going to become terrible. You know, racism is on the rise and uh, inequality, economic inequality is growing. And so I think part of what uh, uh, is important is in this time of enormous change, to figure out a way to imagine ourselves into some kind of an optimistic um, vision of the future. Because if we can't come up with an optimistic vision, we are condemned to a nostalgic vision, one that says, okay, well, the future looks bad, so we should make things like they were 20, 30, 50, or 700 years ago and go back to the golden age of Islam or uh, to Britain, you know, before uh, migrants arrived uh, or, or, you know, America in the 50s. And of course, these golden ages and pastimes weren't quite as golden as we imagined. They were you know, terrible for many people, in fact. So I think to avoid that nostalgic politics, it's important to find a way to have a hopeful sense of adventure about the future. And so in that sense, I think your reaction is, is really related to what uh, my project in the book is. Um, but I suppose the other part of your question, which is to do with what would happen if, if dark people became light uh, in the North. Uh, I think what's interesting is that on the one hand, um, there's been a kind of assumption that that dark people should become light. That you know, if if uh, immigrants uh, adhere to um, the, the values and morals of the site that they go to, they will be accepted. Um, or if dark skinned people behave in such in such way, things will get better. And I think. Um, what the novel suggests is perhaps that's less of a pressing problem. Perhaps the bigger problem is the idea that we uh, uh, have groups, um, uh, some of which are allowed to, in a sense, pass without conveying a sense of threat or suspicion, um, and others aren't. And so, um, in a way, it's not that uh, white people become black in the novel, because what they become isn't clear. Mm. What happens instead is that people begin to converge into a kind of place where racial categories are very difficult to assign. Mm. Um, so it's not, it's not that white people in the novel take on a different race. It's that the idea that you can identify people as white starts to go away. And as a result, we're left without that identifying market. And, and everybody is sort of in, in, um, in the same uh, post-racial kind of boat, uh, which I think is a different thing than saying that, you know, uh, black and brown and other people have now become white, mm -hmm. uh, which is something that so much of, I think, recent history has attempted to do and, and failed to do because it just hasn't succeeded. Uh, this, this idea that you know, immigrants in Europe or in America or black people in America somehow um, will be accepted as white. Uh, yeah. I think it's, it's more interesting to say, what if we get rid of the category? Yeah. What, if, what if we just get to the human? Um, not that that's an easy thing to do. It's actually a very difficult thing to do. But it'll probably happen over the coming centuries. And the novel explores what if it happened in just a few years. Hmm. What if it had happened that everyone in the town had uh, lost their whiteness at the same moment? Because a lot of the drama in this is, well, when is Uma going to change? And when are the parents... Uh, would it just have been more difficult to write a dramatic story if there had been a wand that made everybody change immediately? 
Well, I think there, there are two parts to it. Um, uh, one is that uh, the individual story of Anders, you know, what it's like to be the person this happens to, would have been very different. It would have been a sort of group story. Um, and so the, the experience, his experience would have been not ceasing to be a member of a group, but rather being part of a group that was all having the same mm. experience. So I wanted him to feel like he was no longer part of the group, in a sense. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, but I suppose the other part of it is, is that uh, I think the phenomenon we're experiencing about race and about belonging to groups all over the world, not just in America, because uh, in almost every country, there's some dominant group which has some kind of a strongman leader, um, which is uh, either ascendant or, or, or contesting for power, whether it's in uh, Modi's India or, or the one's Turkey or uh, uh, Bolsonaro's Brazil or Putin's Russia. It's not an America-specific phenomenon that there's some group in power or that's dominant that is, that is trying to assert, in a sense, its own nationalistic identity. Uh, so I think that I think that um, uh, uh, what we're seeing in many societies is is difference, um, and above all, a difference of generations, where sometimes the younger generation is blurring group identities more than the older generation, and this creates enormous anxiety because it creates in, in parents and grandparents perhaps a feeling that oh our children won't be like us, um, you know we, we, our way of life will be left behind. And, and so a big part of this novel is, is the relationship between Anders and his father and Una and her mother. How do you navigate this change, um, not just uh, across individuals, but across generations in the same family? Hmm. The sense of time that you've talked about, uh, centuries really, that comparing how people might look back at differences in nation states 200 years from now might be like the way we look at slavery how could people have thought that made any kind of sense at all uh and is that just sort of built in i mean if everybody in the world had a chance to read this book and go through this kind of a process of imagining uh would it take less than 400 years to be free of this or is it just sort of wired into the the coding of humanity that you don't get to make you don't get to be free of these fictions uh, without the passing of a new generation. I think a lot of this stuff, um, because it does happen in the level of culture and, and our imagining, is, is hard to predict. Um, you know, it's, um, it's not like a river or like a lake. It's something sort of in between, where you have these branches that fall, and that's sort of or a beaver dam that forms. And the lake and the river gets a bit uh, dammed up, and it makes this kind of lake. Uh, and then you think, oh, well, this lake is going to be here forever. And then a big storm comes, or an earthquake comes, or the beavers are eaten by some predators, <laughs> and and that that dam is is swept away, and you know, the lake disappears and it becomes a river again. Uh, I, I think I think human history is like that. So things can look quite static for generations, and then suddenly move quite quickly. And we never really know where we are in that process. So, um, you know, 300 years ago, there was no United States. Um, and things have changed a great deal in those last 300 years. We should expect that 300 years from now, whatever exists where America is, whether that's the United States is currently constituted, whether it's something quite different, is likely to be about as different from America today as America today is from the colonies 300 years ago. Yeah. Uh, but and similarly with race, uh, you know, um, when when uh, Columbus set out on his journey towards India and, and came across the Americas, um, the the Moors had just been expelled from Spain, and uh, and the Spanish what's called the reconquest of Spain by by, Christ, by Christian Spaniards uh, from the Muslim Moors had been completed. Now at that time in Spain, the question was: Were you a Muslim or a Jew? And, uh, and if you were, you know, should you remain in Spain or should you be made to leave? But it wasn't a question of what was your race. Huh. Um, if you were somebody descended from Moors or descended from Jews who was a Catholic, you were fine. Hmm. And I think that's quite interesting because uh, at different moments in human history, different elements of our identity become the thing that we ascribe meaning to. It can be our religion. It can be the language we, we speak. And it can be the color of our skin. 
So, um, so I think the notion that that race will occupy the position in America that it does today, in two or three hundred years, is is not is not likely. And I also think that it isn't necessary for us to wait hundreds of years for the dam to be swept aside. Um, we never know what's going to do it, and so contributing to our imagining of it now, I think, is part of that process of of helping the river along and hoping that it doesn't take two hundred years. The the changing of people's minds, I think I've, I've grown up with sort of an assumption that if someone's wrong, you just have to use rational arguments to show them that they're wrong. And then the light bulb will go off and they will, you know, support Mayor Pete or whatever I'm, I'm wanting to have happen. And uh, but I, I think I've seen you say in another conversation that uh, it's an emotional argument that comes out of these fictional exercises in, in your novels, which can actually change a heart. And then that changes the thinking. It, it, it's at some point people's thinking does change, but does it really only change if they have a, you know, uh, same sex marriage? I mean, it seemed like that changed when there were so many people who had a relative who was gay and, and so their emotional, uh, feeling about that person gradually just sort of sifted up to their head or wh- how, how do you see the the process their emotions versus rational discourse so-called I, I think that very often on, on issues of identity or issues that uh, come close to the tribe that we belong to um, we tend to use reason to justify what our emotional position is um, and so we construct like lawyers do an argument that says what we think makes sense. Um, I think people can sometimes be swayed by reason, but more often they need to be swayed by something else. And what fiction can do is it can invite readers to play a kind of make-believe, where you say, you know, when you're a child and you and your best friend got together, or you and a kid you just met got together, and said, okay, let's pretend we're pirates, um, or let's pretend we're astronauts went and the tree became the mast of the ship and the leaves became the fins of the sharks and you were playing together. Um, In that moment, you've let go in a way of your sense of self. You've taken on a new different play sense of self for the duration of this game. And I think something similar happens when you write a novel or or read a novel. Uh, A novel, unlike a television show or a film, doesn't look anything like the world. Um, you are forced to imagine that world out of these words. And when you imagine, the reader imagines these, these, these worlds, the reader is, is making up the novel. So I think writers write these sort of half novels, which are words, and readers create the other half of the novel, which is the people, the images, the experiences, the emotions. And so when the readers are doing that, they can let go of, in a sense, who they are. Mm. They can become the same way a child playing at being a pirate or an astronaut that goes of the fact that they're an eight-year-old boy or an eight-year-old girl um readers get to do the same thing and so i think that's a place where emotionally people are very fertile and flexible and if after that they sit back and think huh what did that feel like then maybe they will assemble you know a rational argument to support their new position Hmm. but the first thing is you have to feel comfortable with or interested in or or intrigued by the new position. And that's what I think fiction can do. It doesn't tell you what to think. It, it invites you to make believe. And then you might feel differently after doing that. Hmm. Uh, do you have a hard stop in a minute for your next uh, conversation? Yeah, we, we, can do, we can do two minutes, but yeah, but I think a couple okay. minutes. Okay. Uh, well, let me just ask one more question. Uh, I see that the Reluctant Fundamentalist, uh, released in 2018, uh, was made into a movie, and uh, it's available. From what you've just said, the difference between seeing a story versus reading it, uh, did you have a role in the making of that movie, or do you have a, a sense of uh, how authentic it was to the book, and, and maybe because it's a different medium, what kind of imaginings or impact it had based on the same story in the book? I learned a great deal from watching the Latin fundamentalist film get made. And uh, I mean, for me, the first step is a bit like, you know, sending your, your child to school 
is giving your book to a filmmaker. Uh, you know, you, you, you sort of you lose control and you hope that something good will happen. So you better pick, you know, teachers that you trust. Uh, and so Mira Nair, who was the director of, of the film, was somebody I had enormous respect for and who had done incredible work and who really made it her mission to, um, uh, to spend time with me in London. We spent time in New York. She came and stayed with us in Lahore on multiple occasions. Um, she involved me in the early drafts of the script. Uh, I didn't write the final script. It was uh, written by other, uh, another writer. Um, but uh, uh, but I, had a, I had, I guess you could say, a consultative role on the project. But in, in the end, um, of course, the film is the vision of the director. And I think the biggest distinction between a film and a book is that in a book, every reader gets to be the director of their version of the novel. In a film, of course, the director has to do that. Um, they have to cast, you know, uh, uh, they have to cast Kiefer Sutherland, for example, as the boss, or Liev Schreiber as the unnamed American who's only called you in the book, uh, and 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 that creates an enormous, you know, effect. And so, I suppose what the book did was it tried to present people with an incredibly ambiguous situation and to ask them, what do your instincts make you do in this ambiguous situation? You, the reader. And what does that reveal about you? Um, it's just a conversation. And yet it feels like it's something very threatening and dangerous. You know, why? In, in the film, of course, um, the ambiguity has to go away because we know what's going on. But in the film, uh, something else quite beautiful happens, which is that it's a collaboration of, of a couple hundred people from all over the world. You know, uh, an Indian film director, a Pakistani writer, actors from all over coming to make this joint work of art together. And so even if the film, I guess, formally is very different from the book, in spirit, the idea of bringing people together to make collaboratively is very similar. Wow, that's fascinating. Um, can you say what you're working on next, your your next uh, novel or project? You know, I, 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 I'm sort of getting close to the... the what I will say is that... Um, I think of, of writing much more like digging a well than climbing a mountain. So uh, it's less saying, okay, that's the peak that I'm headed towards. <laughs> and more, I'm going to make this empty hole in the ground for <laughs> a, few hours, a few hours of my day where I sit around doing nothing else. And eventually that hole is going to fill with water. So I'm, I'm digging the hole right now. You're digging the well. That's good to know. I have been speaking with Mohsen Hamid, author of his fifth novel, The Last White Man, available for pre-order with release on August 2nd by Riverhead uh, Books. That's an imprint of Penguin Random House. Thanks very much, Mohsen. Thank you very much. Okay, and uh, that's it. We'll, uh, okay, so I'll end the meeting, and uh, thank you very much for the book. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a wonderful adventure, and I'm going to be – uh, sharing it with lots of people, including my 16-year-old grandson. Great. Well, thank you, Lennon. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you very much. Well, I enjoyed that conversation a great deal as well. And as I was thinking about it while doing some light editing and tightening it up, uh, one thing which I noticed was how Mosin used uh, metaphors or similes. Uh, you know, one of the basic things that a writer learns to make the writing powerful and to help people understand things by imagining them in a different way. And uh, there were three that I, I made notes of here on my iPad. Uh, one was when he talked about human history being like lakes and rivers with beaver dams once in a while, uh, blocking the river and forming a lake, but then suddenly the, the dam can break and the river continues on flowing, and that we don't know where we are in this process. Is the change going to happen 300 years from now? Is it going to happen maybe next year or next month? Uh, and I, I thought that was just a great way to see the way he looks at the long view of history in his writing uh, and in a a scene that you can imagine. I've, I've seen beaver dams and, and rivers and the idea that there's a flow to human history that uh, has those kind of characteristics. I, I love that. I thought that was really great. The other one that I liked is when I asked him about what it was like to have The Reluctant Fundamentalist, his debut novel, turned into a movie. And he said it's like sending your child to school, you know, and you, you hope that there's going to be a good teacher. And in this case, he picked a, a director who he 
who he respected. But once you've written a book, and I've heard from other authors, you know, you, you have so little control generally. It sounds like he was much more involved in this process than most authors are when their uh, books are optioned for movies. But yes, just like sending a child off to school. And then the final one really delighted me because I, I frequently ask uh, authors who I know are uh, continuing to write, what can, what can you say about your next project? And usually there's a reluctance to say much of anything because they're in the midst of it and for various reasons. But I've never heard anyone uh, come up with an image that was so striking uh, saying that he is at work on a new book and it's like digging a well. It's not like climbing a mountain where he can say, you see that peak over there, that, uh, that mountain? I, I'm going to climb that. I'm going to write a book about X. Instead, he's going down into uh, another imaginative space. I, this is my assumption. And he's just going to keep digging and, and looking for the things which uh, will transition into uh, his next novel. Related to this is the way he talks about fiction uh, electrified me. To, to see uh, the power of fiction described uh, in his note to the reader, which I asked him to read a little bit of uh, when we started out, and t to explain that fiction is like make-believe, and that when we're children and, you know, you, you pretend you're a pirate, or we, I can remember with my cousins, we used to go to Cape Cod, and there was an old dory sunk in a swamp, and we pretended that we were, I don't know if it was pirates, but we were, you know, moving that dory around in a very adventurous way, and that in that kind of make-believe, we let go of our sense of self. You know, I, I don't know if I was going to prep school at that point and wearing a coat and tie uh, to seventh grade, uh, but when I was there in the swamp with my cousins making the, that pretend, all of the things that I thought were so central to my identity in school simply dropped away. You know, they, they, they just didn't exist. And to spend time in that imaginative place and letting go of who I think I am when I'm reading a novel, which is uh, that gripping, uh, because in that space, people, as he says, are, are fertile, we're flexible, uh, and you get a chance to just be intrigued by a different kind of a life. So in these five novels that he's now put out, uh, starting with the one that he started writing when he was at Princeton, working with Toni Morrison, they're powerful because they use the imaginative power of fiction to take on huge issues, race, migration. Uh, and uh, that's different than just writing another novel and hoping it's a good novel and it's a good story. It, 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 there's kind of a redemption of the whole genre in the way he talks about fiction. And then that gets to the whole idea that he's, he's co-creating the novel. Now, there, if you Google reviews of The Last White Man, you'll find a, f a few negative ones, Publishers Weekly, and uh, I can't remember where the other one I read was. And they, they each had a, a similar complaint, which was there's, there's a lot of detail that's withheld. We don't know where the the city is where Anders and Una live. We we don't know the the time precisely, and in the, there are many of the details that would make you go into a story uh, are just withheld. And and I it made sense to me. I, I understood why people were saying that because there's a, a real sparse uh, kind of structure to the novel, and it's it's only 188 pages long. It's a very short novel, but. When I see what he was trying to do, which was to bring the reader into a, a co-creation of this story by putting the things in, okay, the light people are becoming dark, and how would you react if, if that was you? And because the setting is leaves a lot to the imagination, I think perhaps it brings the co-creating reader more... Um, imaginatively into the project of, well, how would this look in your life? What do you think of this? Enter this make-believe space with me, imagine it. And then when you come out, you may be changed in how you look at the issue that this book considers. I, I read you some of those rave reviews, and they're, they, they by far outnumber the reviews that uh, 
uh, talk about it in, in less uh, enthusiastic terms, maybe there's some people that are just missing the point of the project, which I find to be a bold, ambitious, and, and very inspiring one. So it was a great honor to uh, have a chance to visit with Mohsen Hamid. And I think if you're interested in the book, I, I can recommend it highly. It's available on Amazon. And you'll be having a chance to hear a lot of uh, reviews, conversations. I'll, I'll put as many uh, links to interviews that I've seen him do, not, not necessarily just about this book, although they'll start populating now that the book is out, uh, so that if you are interested, as interested in his writing and his sensibility as, as I have become, you'll, you'll find some other ways to uh, enjoy it. That's it for this episode of the Kindle Chronicles. Uh, I've got two more interviews this month. Later in the month, I'll be talking with uh, the, 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 the fellow that my grandson Jake and Ryan told me about, Mark Cheverton, who writes books based in, set in Minecraft. And Jake is already working on questions for him so that when we talk to him, I'll, I'll have some of my own questions and some for my eight-year-old grandson. And then uh, the week after that, I'll be talking to the winner of the 2021 Nobel uh, Prize in Literature about his multi-generational uh, story set in East Africa. Very exciting. I really appreciate your taking the time to listen to my podcast. Have a great day. Bye.